Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Thank you for joining me here at this podcast and radio show as well as YouTube video. So, so many ways that you can enjoy the show. And I ask you folks, thank you for the amazing comments you leave, by the way. I love knowing what resonates with you and why. So trust me, I read all your comments. Thank you for that. And if you love the show, please give us a five-star review and subscribe. The show will come right into your inbox on a weekly basis, and you'll be the top at the food chain to be able to see who and what is sharing with you this week. So uh, I, I should have brought my big red nose. I have one of those big red noses because I had some surgery on my back this week. I had a little bit of um, sun, sun issue, right? Like a little bit of precancerous stuff. And so I thought it was going to be like a little bloop, but it turned out to be like more the shape of an eye. And in all my vanity, it's going to be a two inch scar on my back. Super not happy about that because it's where you could see if I wear tank tops or summer dresses. But to make myself feel better, I got one of those big red noses and I was walking around calling myself Patch Dashinger. So if you remember that Robin Williams movie, you'll appreciate the reference. Have to make light of things. And uh, I think. I think there's been like a lot of shifting going on. And I think next week, Dr. John D. Martini's coming on. He's coming to Los Angeles and his team reached out and he wants to come on and talk about overcoming fear, which I think is a fabulous conversation. So welcome to Dare to Dream. And as you can see, every show is uh, pretty much cool and your number one transformation conversation. I wanna thank first off Dr. Dean here for sponsoring this show. Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness do some extraordinary energy work and healing work out into the world. If you feel like a definitely different person, dare to dream, Debbie Dashinger, definitely different, you're in the right company, go ahead and check them out. Dr. Dane here, D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com as well as accessconsciousness.com. They've got classes all over the world very highly recommended. And I've got an amazing guest here today who is Rachel Kaplan. And besides daring to make your inner dreams a reality, she talks about healing your shit. So we're going there. And if you've ever thought about what your core wound might be, hmm, this is our guest today, Rachel Kaplan. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and the creator and host of the Feeling Healing Shit Show podcast. Rachel was trained in cutting-edge Western psychological technologies, as well as ancient spiritual and healing modalities of Eastern religions. Her therapeutic shit show offers a relatable and humorous approach to real healing. Rachel has a thriving practice in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you can learn more about her and her show at thehealingfeelingshitshow.com. Rachel, 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 welcome to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you and your shit show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. This is so awesome. I mean, I love the fact that we even started there. How did you have the audacity to name your show Shit and Healing Feeling Shit Show? Um, I have the audacity because... Our digestive system, the fact that we shit and that everyone shits is the single best metaphor to understand how we need to relate to our emotional system. And I think it's hilarious. I personally um, like making light of things, having fun. I think what what's the point of healing if we don't enjoy our lives? And so, uh, and what is life if not a shit show? What is healing if not a shit show? And when I talk about, you know, how we relate to our our literal shit, uh, my clients light up and people get it. And every single person, whether they're Republican or a CEO or whatever they are, they shit. And also all of us have emotional pain. And so I'm saying, hey guys, let's get real with this. Let's get skilled at having our emotional pain so we actually can heal and enjoy our lives. And in case anybody didn't get it, of course, your logo is literally a pile of poop with a big smile on it. Yeah, it's a, and people are always like, it's a kissing poop. I'm like, that's oh, just pretty. I found a pretty poop. Yeah, it's my face right next to a poop emoji. And you know, I think there's there's hook, there's pizzazz. Uh, my my jingle, which was the first thing I did once I decided to make a podcast, it ends in a flush. That's a really good jingle. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> 
That's so hilarious. I had a friend in college who was one of the funniest people, one of the brightest and funniest people I'd ever met. We were both in theater arts together. And he used to make up these ridiculous outgoing voicemail messages. Love. And one of them was, hi, this is Jerry. No, this time it's a really serious message. Have a good day. Leave me a message. And as soon as it, right before it went beep, you heard the toilet flush. Awesome. <laughs> he got that in there. <laughs> That's great. That's when you thought he was for real. So yeah. emotional potty training yes. for grownups. Yes. You're talking about the relationship between our bodily function and then emotional potty training. How does that correlate? Right. So let's say, Debbie, whether it was this morning or this afternoon or tomorrow or tonight, whenever it is, when you have to take your next shit, when you get that signal, I love you, this already. I just yeah. want to say I'm so with you. Good. So you're going to get a feeling in your body that you've been trained to identify. Now, when you get that feeling, are you going to say to yourself, hmm, maybe I'm hungry or maybe I should post something fabulous and get some likes or maybe if I buy a new shirt or call my boo, I won't have that feeling. Do you think those thoughts when you get that signal from your body that you have to shit? Uh, no. No. What do, you, what do you do? What do you think? <laughs> What do I think? Like relief, I suppose. Yeah, like you got to go poop, right? We can get on with our day, yeah. Yeah, you, you, but the first, the first step is you go to the bathroom and you shit, right? I, first of all, I, obviously we can say shit on your show. You've been saying it for minutes. This will be marked explicit. So that's the thing. So we know because we were actually potty trained that when we get the signal from our bodies that we need to shit, that that's the only thing that will make us not need to shit. Now, when it comes to emotional pain and emotions, first of all, take off the letter E off the word emotion. What do you have? Right. Motion. Motion. Right, so it, motion. it literally means to move. Um, I, I like that people use energy, but I don't know if that's actually inherent in the Latin or not. But either way, it's like m movement is included. And when we get the signal from our bodies, and my definition for emotion is intense clusters of sensation rolling in squats. So we got these like, you know, movements of heat. Let's say you're angry, you feel heat. You feel um, maybe tension in your limbs or clenching in your face or your fists. It's sensation, right? A, a heartache literally will be a heaviness in the chest, a trembling of the face. When we get those signals as non-emotionally potty trained grownups or teenagers or elders, we do everything we can. We, we think to distract ourselves, we watch something, we read something, we buy something, we eat something, smoke something, drink something, um, try to get validation. Basically, the way I see it is our culture and our world is funded by us believing that we can outrun our emotions and consume them away, distract them away. And so what that leaves, what I see is that we have, you know, a world full of people who have no idea how to deal with their pain. Um, and, you know, they're addicted, they're depressed, they're anxious, they have imposter syndrome. And basically the only way, and I think they're very similar, just like the pooping system or the sweating system is a means of our body to create homeostasis. The emotional system is the same where something happens, we have a feeling, the thing that relieves the feeling is letting the feeling move through us like a poop. And so it should be easy, but it's not because we've all spent decades, varying amounts of decades, avoiding the feelings. And so my shit show is a step-by-step -step course of understanding how did you get this way and how do you actually restore your body's capacity to move your feelings so you can regain well-being, really be who you are, and have what I call emotional resilience, which I think is absolutely 100% better than happiness. Because if you're emotionally resilient, you're probably happy most of the time. But it, what it is, is it's a sense of whatever life throws at me, because we know life's going to throw shit at us, because that's what life is. We're going to die, right? Whatever life throws at me, I can handle it because I can move all of my feelings, my fear, my heartbreak, my shame, my pain, through me like a poop. So to me, it's like the silver bullet. It's the thing that actually heals people. And unless you, your emotions can move, I think you can't be well. Yeah. So there's, there's a few things I want to say about that. And yes, we are in a society that does not honor, for the most part, feelings. Yes. And has a big thing about suppressing them mm -hmm. and not expressing them. I also want to say that as a metaphysician, one of the things I don't like that is pretty pervasive out there is there are many metaphysicians, law of attraction, people who say, well, you choose, you decide, right? right? Yeah. So you don't have to feel that way. 
And I actually take exception to that because I think we feel what we feel. Right. And I think that the, the true healing, exactly as you're saying, is that something is allowed to flow through us. When it doesn't and it gets locked inside, we're volcanic, right? Yes. We're yes. Sitting on something really big. Right. And one of the things I've noticed, so I don't like that and I'll put that off to the side. And I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's like putting a sticker on a pile of poop. You're like, you're, you put your affirmation on all this pain, but it's like, it doesn't, if, if it was a, even if it's a scratch and sniff sticker, it's still going to smell like shit. Totally. Yes. So it, it, it is, it's alarming to me because those are the very people, the sensitive people, the people who are looking for healing, right? Who actually should be supportive of it. And nobody's saying wallow in it. We're just saying right. heal through yeah. it, right? Feel By it yeah. using it. Feel it yeah. out. And uh, the other thing that I think is very interesting about emotion and, and energy and motion or emotion is that, you know, it can get locked up without us even knowing it. This can be ancient, ancient stuff yeah. that we at some point in our life didn't deal with and we're completely not even subconsciously aware of it. Right. So how do you deal with that? Because that's pretty big stuff to unearth. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the first, as soon as I, my first opening episode is like, come on board, have your feelings. But the, the next step is really looking at how do we get wounded and how do we heal from that? And it's very much what you're talking about, about this experience of locked up. And I actually use the metaphor of locking certain parts of us in a basement closet. So what, what I see as the root of that is, you know, there's lots of roots, right? And we can look at past lives and depending on, you know, you get pretty far out here. So that's cool. But in just in any human life, um, a baby is so dependent and so vulnerable that it is biologically wired to need the closeness, proximity and care of a parent as much as it needs food. Because if it doesn't have that, it won't have food, right? So it's like our survival depends on on this uh, need to feel close to our caregiver. And so as little uh, animals, we're just constantly tracking what makes us lose care. And so it might be as simple as, you know, a mom becomes vacant when the baby starts crying, looks overwhelmed, the baby starts to get, oh, I lose mom if I cry. As we age and we learn language and all these other things, there's so many signals, both subtle and you know, overt where we're being told, don't be that way, boys, don't cry, don't walk on your toes like that, you shouldn't, whatever it is. And so we're so wired, and this is the foundation of uh, attachment theory in therapy or in psychology, we're so wired to need that, that we start doing whatever we can to push those parts down. And that's, I think, the origin of imposter syndrome is, you know, it makes sense that we need to do that because we need to feel loved. And it also makes sense um, and it was one of my favorite theories in grad school, I won't get really into it, but that we need to think it was our fault. Because if when you're that vulnerable child, you have two options basically of how to perceive reality. You can either realize you're vulnerable, you're innocent, and the people you depend on for food and shelter are not trustworthy, so you're fucked. <laughs> Is it okay that I say fuck? That's a little bit higher than shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Or the other option is you can think that it was somehow your fault, you were bad, and if you become good, if you do things well enough, then, then you'll keep the love you need. And so most people are walking around with some disenfranchised experience or side of themselves that's locked down, like you said, and thinking that it's their fault, thinking that somehow that aspect of them, whether it's just an emotion or some expression of them makes them unlovable. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the simplest way to say of how do I deal with that is, first of all, it, I mean, I use the metaphor of you got to go down into the creaky, dank, dark, scary basement where you've locked all these parts up and they're rotting. Because imagine even a plant in a dark closet is going to rot, let alone little little kid parts, but you have to open the door, watch fumes fly out and then back away and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Debbie Dashinger. <laughs> and I know you shouldn't, you don't trust me because I have, I've been a shit to you. Because in the beginning, we can blame our parents who were doing their best, by the way. But eventually, we, we cultivate, you know, the consciousness to do that repression ourselves. Um, and so you, we have to start by very gently approaching these parts and saying, I want to know you. I want I'm going to turn you into, you know, I want to take you out of scapegoat, the thing that I'm avoiding, the thing that I have repulsion from, to 
VIP to the most important part of my life. I'm going to check on you. And I have all kinds of like actual practical steps that people can do. Things like making a picture of yourself as a kid, your home screen, the, the age where you feel the least lovable. So every time you see it, you're like, oh, there I am. And I'm cute and awkward. And also people around oh, you are like, yeah. who's that? Yeah. yeah. Or like asking it what it wants to eat and starting to tune into what is this part of you need. And mm -hmm. the process of healing this part is it's almost like these parts of us didn't develop with the rest of us. And so in order to realize who we are, these badass, amazing people we are as grownups, and in order for us to feel like that's actually who we are versus we're a cover up mm -hmm. for that wounded, unlovable secret in the basement, we need to incorporate them. And it's really at the heart of it. It's about giving care. It's about tuning in. And then the, the main crux of what they need other than care and attention and contact is to be able to have enough support to release the backlog of emotional pain that they've been sitting with and unable to feel because they're repressed. And so the heart of the shit show is actual steps on how do you move each of the core emotions? Um, how do you work with the pain? How do you create the connection with that part that's holding the pain? And then how do you actually move the pain enough so that it starts releasing just decades of shit and it can come into being where we feel whole and integrated and like, I'm actually a badass. Right. And you know, the reintegration part is really fascinating. Obviously, it can't happen without the expression that got locked away that you're talking about. And the reintegration is actually akin to what shamans do. And they do that thing called soul retrieval, right? right? Yeah. So something happens, we choose not to feel or deal, we split right. off from it. Where right. does that go? But right. we carry on somehow, but we're really not whole because right. that piece is still here in that moment in time. And so what sh some shamans do is pretty spectacular is they go back and retrieve this. Right. So, right, we become whole and woven together. And Yeah, I've had that experience. I have as well. And I have to, like, no joke, right? Deep, deep, like life movement. Yeah. Threads of life that get completely unwound and yeah. reconfigured by virtue of working with somebody like that. Yeah. It's big time. I want I, you to be able to, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing I think that's powerful about this work is that I'm really, and, it, and, and you know, I, this is a very personal path for me, but I, I, I came into this work. I had a mentor and a healer who really, after 25 years of studying the healing path because of a tragedy that happened in my life um, when I was 14, you know, I just was devoted to it. But this, this work specifically was the most useful thing for me. And um, I think what's so powerful about it is it's teaching someone how to do it for themselves. And I think that it's so useful to have help. And he was helping me for sure. And shamans and people who have these gifts, it's so useful. But I think that if we don't know how to integrate it, if we don't know how to do that for ourselves if we don't actually learn how to move the emotions and how to find ourselves in some way for ourselves, then we end up in either codependence or we end up kind of with a vision of what's possible from us for us, but not really able to actualize it. Mm -hmm. I like the slow and steady wins the race vibe. Right. You like the turtle deal. Okay. Yeah, I didn't always. I was like big, you know, but this guy was like, oh no, highs and lows. You know, because we end up just on a, then we just chase the intensity, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of just slowing down and tuning in and learning how to become subtle enough and skilled enough and strong enough to feel our fucking pain. Yeah, it's huge right now. Like to be alive in this day and to say, it's okay to just sit in this. Yeah. I don't even care if you give yourself five minutes to feel what's literally going on. Yeah. If you can have five minutes without looking at your phone, you're pretty much a master. <laughs> No food, no gambling, no sex, no TV, no, like, her, just be. It's a big deal. Yeah. I want you to explain to people, I understand imposter syndrome, and I think it's fascinating. Just explain to them what that means so they can track what you're talking about. Yeah. So what I mean by it is a sense of, like, someone might be incredibly successful and skilled at what they do. They might be high in the ranks of a company, or they may have, you know, all the money. A good example might be Anthony Bourdain or Robin Williams, like someone from the outside yeah. um, where it looks like they have it all, but they are sitting with, or you, if you're the person we're talking about, are sitting with a sense of, if people knew me well enough, they would know that I'm actually full of it, that um, I'm hiding this thing, that I don't actually deserve this. And what I see is that 
you know, work and success and validation are such natural um, candies that we go to. They're such, they're such kind of, they're almost what we want and need. We want to feel, I think the core wound is around, am I worthy? Am I okay? Am I enough? And therefore, based on that, do I belong? Am I accepted here? Do I belong in this family? Am I wanted? But it's really about like, am I enough to belong, right? And so, you know, it's such a natural impulse to chase validation and success and all these external means. But if there's no place for it to land, you know, that's when you get into people who are just, you know, working to the bone, relentlessly focused on achieving it and empty inside and, and really sick or unable to stop or, you know, God forbid at the end of their achievement of what we're taught the pinnacle of success is, they take their lives, whether an overdose or suicide, because they still have pain, you know? So it's really about not feeling as good as you look or yeah. as worthy of what you have. And in this day of social media being so pervasive, yeah. I would assume that imposter syndrome is at an all-time high. Yeah. All you have to do is open your, you know, you pick what your du jour is in social media. Right. And there's always going to be comparing yourself. I, you know, I have a friend actually who used to, this is a really beautiful human, like physically beautiful mm -hmm. human beautiful on the inside, mm. tons of friends, well-loved, very smart. I could go on and on with the accolades who used to say over and over, yeah, I opened Facebook and I read about who such and such as husband was going on, waxing on and on about how much they loved their wife and their amazing relationship. And da, da, da. she would get so caught up in yeah. what women said about their men, men said about their women and felt so terribly left out. Yeah. Did she not have a relationship or a shitty relationship? Well, that's a, that's a great question because she was, she is not now. She wasn't in a marriage. Well, I'm so and proud I, of her for leaving. That was not yeah, the right marriage. Was not the right marriage. hundred percent. And I think that disparity was showing up yeah. in social media, right? Showing her like what she doesn't have, even though let's be really, let's like level the playing field. It's all bullshit anyway. Right. Yeah, right. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe 30% of that is for real. Yeah. And the other 70%, she'd come back and say, you know, those people on social media are writing how much they love each other. They got divorced. Uh -huh, right. <laughs> yeah. The real question I think is what happened after that. I mean, it takes a ton of strength to leave a marriage. Um, you know, I think we've both done that, right? Yes. Um, congratulations, yeah. us. Um, uh, but I think, you know, and I do think that our triggers, our jealousies, uh, the ways we compare ourselves can be really good maps to find who's in the basement. The things that we project onto others that we're sure everyone has it better are often, you know, the flip side of where we feel like not enough. So if you are listening to this or anyone who's not sure, you know, what's locked away or how they're insecure or what part of them they need to make the VIP, you can always use your triggers as a map of how to find the pain inside. Um, but I do wonder with this friend if she did the work to leave and if, and if she did the work to feel worthy of the love she wants. How's she doing? <laughs> it's interesting. She's actually, I think, dating seriously way faster than she thought she would. She's very desirable, so I'm not surprised. She's so far, I'm very impressed with who she's attracting. Cool. Like, very, very available. Wow. And at the same time, when you ask about the healing work, my point with the imposter part is it just makes me wonder. So when somebody has all of this yumminess, but this one piece is what they keep focusing on as though I am a failure because, yep. mm, and yep. I don't have what I perceive the others do. Yep. So how do you, Rachel, recommend people heal? If that's a core wound, I am yep. not, I don't match up. Yeah. I mean, look great but if anybody knew if you pull back the curtain sure do, Debbie right what a <laughs> shit show you'd find yeah. Exactly. What a shit show. Well, and um, so we would start by the pieces I've spoken to a little bit around the curiosity and the establishing the relationship um, with the parts. So it's like you really do have to do a little bit of reflection about what did your parents value? What did you feel like you weren't good enough at when you were little? What are the things that you try to hide from colleagues or um, friends or new boyfriends or girlfriends, um, like to get a sense of where does the shame lie. Um, and, you know, 
it's, and then, and then simultaneously, what I'm hoping people do and what I'm teaching people to do is then learn how do you, when you find those parts, how do you slow down enough and learn? And this is a combination of like mindfulness, but it's slightly different than the kind of mindfulness that is trying to have us just observe everything from the outside. There's a lot of bypassing that happens in spirituality and, and in meditation. And I did my, my undergrad thesis is on meditation and like I have deep roots. I've been teaching, practicing yoga for 20 years, teaching for almost that, uh, although I'm retired in that way. There's just not enough time. But um, so this is kind of the opposite where you're using an embodied practice of knowing how to move your consciousness into your actual physical body where those clusters of sensations are rolling in squads, the emotions, remember? Um, and, but learning how to actually find the pain, have a strong enough connection with the pain where you can feel the pain and then actually become the part that's in pain mm -hmm. and, and to release the pain and then move back out of the pain to, back to the grown up self that can do something I call reality testing, which is like, you know, establishing into the sense of worth. And the important thing here is this. When people are like fantastic in 75% way or like 80, 95% of them feels great and there's this 5% wound, let's say, what's sad is that the 5% wound always feels like the truth. Mm. Like those parts of us, just based on how young we were when they came online, yeah. how nonverbal they are, how core they are, they, that's why I think when people talk about um, even core beliefs or, you know, like when they think about it as in terms of thoughts, it's, it's kind of misleading because to these parts, they feel like truth. And so what we need to learn to do, what I see most, you know, spiritually adept or psychologically adept folks doing is they're like, part of me feels bad. You're not bad. You're great. You have this great podcast. You have this new boyfriend. No, I'm bad. It's like you get into a war and it's almost like if you were trying to ride two horses. Right, living you know? in duality, which is not good. It's like no. sweltered personality. Exactly. So instead, what we want to do is you want to get enough confidence from hearing this, from listening to the shit show, from recognizing, of course I have pain. Nobody doesn't. Right. I'm not supposed to not have pain. You get all this confidence and you start practicing with these skills that are actually skills that you start cultivating and then enough strength to actually be able to come to become the part that's in pain and sink into it. And really, I call them like, parties. It's like you have a, 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 a sadness party or an anger party. You actually become the part that's like, oh my God, like I am sure that I'm not enough. And if you knew that about me, you wouldn't want me on your show. You wouldn't talk to me. I'm, I'm full of shit. It's like, feel the pain in that. It's excruciating to feel like we're worthless and that people won't love us. It's really, I mean, I can feel it now. It's like, so how do you let yourself become that sink to the bottom of that well where there's a door, you know, that you can go through and then after climb out of it and be like, okay, now what was actually true? You know, is it true? Do I know for sure that no one loves me? Or is it true that I actually have a lot of reason to feel worthy or lovable? And when I, and when you're doing reality testing, you want to go for very, um, not like the blown out spiritual foo-foo, I am perfect because these parts of us don't believe it. It's like looking for something that feels believable to this part. So it's pretty like it's you start with a low bar. You know, it might be, you know, just like, wow, I had so much strength. I was able to cry for 10 minutes. Mm. Like that's huge. It's huge. It's funny. What? People are afraid that if they start feeling, they'll never stop. I'm like, good luck. Let me right. see you do that for three minutes straight. I'll give you a cookie, you know? Yeah. How nice would it be? Uh, you know, I'm not someone who cries very much. And I, I did when I, I was growing up, I would, I've always been a very sensitive person, mm -hmm. but it's interesting how the older I've gotten, the less I cry and the more difficult it is to access. Yeah. I don't know what that's about, but I can say that the times I do, I relish it. Like, yeah. Oh, I can yeah. literally feel the relief. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, amazing, right? It's like, it actually feels amazing. Yeah. So episode eight might help you. It's all about sadness. So, you know, the other piece of the work of how you heal that is really just like, you know, it's like what I just described of like descending the consciousness into the pain, moving it and coming out is like the basic thing you try to do with all the feelings. And then because feelings are so different, like anger is energetically opposite as far as how it moves than sadness, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we're angry, we want to explode. We want to destroy. We get hot. It goes out. It's fast. 
sadness is an implosion or bogged down. We need to descend and slow down and release and water falls out of our face, you know? And so you have different skills and there are different tools you can use to do that. And at a most basic level, your problem and everyone's problem of having less access to the feelings is I think that, you know, the best metaphor I found is, you know, if you forget to download your movie before you got to the airport, I don't care how long your, your layover is. There's no way you're going to watch that movie because the, the airport Wi-Fi sucks, right? It's like there's no way to get a file that big on with a, with a flimsy, thin bandwidth. And similarly, when we, when we repress or just live more and more time trying to not have feelings, the feelings get bigger and bigger. Mm. And so we need a stronger container. We need more bandwidth, more strength to be able to move it. And that's part of what I do as a therapist is I'm like – a, a Wi-Fi hotspot, and I am amplifying. I'm using everything about me to amplify the person's ability to connect to their pain and move it. I'm also like a colonics expert, where I'm just like massaging their emotional colon. Um, but you, there are other techniques you can do at home, and I give tons of of tips for each emotion of how you can increase your bandwidth. And then over time, and with practice, it becomes much easier. And once you realize this makes me feel better, then it's motivating. Yeah. So then I imagine if it makes you feel better, you're very energized. So then you'd be akin to a coffee enema, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coffee enema. <laughs> so what I love about what you're saying, Rachel, is, you know, interestingly enough, the correlation is I teach this in visibility. Mm. So I teach people how to write books. Oh, cool. Right. And one of the things I teach in my classes always is write what you are afraid of. Mm. It's the same awesome, go to it, pen yeah. it, get it out. That's yeah. the shit people want to read. Right. That's the stuff we That's the shit. with, right? That's yeah. the cutting edge stuff where you're going yeah. where nobody else is going. And same exact thing, although it's, it's somewhat different when I teach about being interviewed, right? About the visibility and the importance of getting booked on radio and podcasts because a lot of people want to show up and deliver what they think uh -huh. an audience wants to hear. Not so much. Boring, right? yeah. It's so disingenuous. But if huh. they can uh, understand that they have their own unique, through their woundedness, through their brilliance, right. they have a very unique point of view and message. And if they can own that, yeah. that's where they rock and roll. So we are very aligned. That's awesome. Right? Yeah. Psychology and also because, funny. you know, the secret, you know, the, all the internet memes say this, that like we should be ourselves. But, you know, and I, first of all, no one's saying, though, how hard it is because to be ourselves, we have to heal and we have to embody these wounded places, which takes mm -hmm. skill. But I really I have come to fully get and um, love that, you know, there's it's not like we're given a multiple choice thing when we come into these bodies. It's like, do you want to be loud or soft? Do you want to be this or that? It's like, you know, of course, we can be ourselves with varying degrees of balance, but we have essentially our, our essence to embody. And the good news is we only have to be one person well, and it's us. And it's mm -hmm. obviously the most interesting for audiences and in books. And it's also the place where I think we're going to have the most synchronicity in our lives. And so it's like getting on board with how do we heal who we are so we can be who we are, which I am really enjoying in my life. <laughs> and we're not for everyone, but like great news. It's like, there's lots of people, find your people, be yourself. Totally. Exactly. Find your tribe. Yeah. Well, like if you're listening and watching Dare to Dream Radio and Podcast, you can become part of the Dare to Dream team. Go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. You can donate to the show because you have a big purpose to fulfill and that's where I show up and that's where the show shows up. We've been on air, uh, podcast, YouTube for over 12 years. And I ask you, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail. Hmm. What would it take for you to feel completely free and bold? So this is the place where you can learn all those pieces of how to get there, how to be that, how to allow that and receive that in your life. So Dare to Dream, this show is always going to be free to you. And for the price of a cup of coffee, a dollar or more, you can completely support the show. And I thank you in advance for your support. Again, go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. And if you're tuning in after we started, Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, this is my amazing guest, Rachel Kaplan. And she is offering you a complimentary core wound quiz. 
you can go to yourcorewound.com. Rach, tell us about that, corewound.com. Um, yeah, so I basically made a quiz. I did it after I met you uh, at the New Media Summit. I'm like, what a great idea, a quiz, because we all want to know about ourselves. And it will take people about five minutes probably to fill out. You just um, slide some sliders numerically based on how much you relate to different statements. And it emails, I get an email, um, and I look at every single person's quiz. I've looked at like 200 quizzes so far, wow. barely publicize this, but just from other podcast interviews. And I will see which um, of the four kind of core emotions um, you your, it dominates your core wound. So. Uh, and then I send you, I will email you uh, a little video, the episode that correlates to that emotion and a list of skills to try. So a video of me in my house kind of giving you some insider tips, uh, the episode that you need to hear. And so what it will enable you to do is diving into the skill part of the podcast journey of the Healing Feeling Shit Show um, to start to get this moving. I do suggest for people who really want emotional resilience and real healing to, to listen to the whole podcast, but it's a long podcast. The, the uh, episodes are about hour to an hour and a half each. And there's so much, it's really like a massive transformational course for free, um, which was an interesting choice on my part. But anyway, um, but so this will give you right into the action and I give you a free little kit and then you will need the skills for each of the emotions because it's like an onion and it's not linear and they're connected. Um, but I give you the the one that you need the most and you can try it out and just see, you know, how you like it. Okay. And it also will enable you to hear more about my work. Tell me about the four core wounds. What are they? Yeah, well, so it's interesting because the four core emotions and my high school therapist, um, so I, I know I said I had a tragedy. Did I say what it was? No, I was going to get there, but can yeah. we start with the four core yeah. wounds? Then... Okay, so, um, but my high school therapist taught me this. So there's four core feelings and you know, there's, if you look at those feeling charts, like that you see on your fridge, well, how are you feeling today? There's a lot of options, right? But most of them are fairly heady and they're nuanced, which doesn't mean they're not feelings, but because feelings are physical, it actually serves us to get into the body and to break it down to their simplest kind of like the primary colors of emotion. And so the four core feelings that every human whole or not whole, healthy or not whole or healthy or unhealthy will have is happy, mad, sad, scared. Now my show doesn't deal with happy, even though it could because most of us, and Brene Brown says that joy is actually the most vulnerable emotion. It's mm -hmm. like most of us don't do that well with happy. We know what it's like to chase highs, but you know, happiness has its own ball of wax there. But what I'm dealing with are the emotions related to wounds. And so it's mad, sad, scared, and ashamed or shame. And shame and worth, I would, another way to describe it is worthlessness. And so um, in the podcast, we start with mad and sad because those are like really unidirectional. It's like mad explodes, like I said, sad implodes. Fear and shame are more nuanced. Um, and so it generally helps to get the first primary movements in place first. Um, and they can kind of usually go in either direction. Like someone who's afraid might feel really frenetic and they need to shake and they need to kind of move, or they might feel like a, a frozen deer in headlights and they need to swaddle and cry. And so there's more nuance and more kind of, um, fine tuning of how to move it. And shame also, it's like it burns shame so deep that, you know, it takes some skill, but if, if your core wound is shame, I'll send you the shame package. You can listen to it and you might need the others, mm -hmm. which I make very affordable, but, um, yeah. Or, you know, and, and the podcast has them all there for free. So. Interesting. I thought you were going to say things like abandonment as a core wound. Um, well, I mean, th th these are the emotional tones of your core wound. Right. So is someone is someone drowning in fear or sadness? Like some people are going to feel just so bogged down with depression and sadness, um, you know, that that's that's the overwhelming thing. It may have come from abandonment, but in some way, what, what the, the cool thing here, and this is why I I'm so committed to this, that I literally have two full time jobs. <laughs> you know, my full-time job is employing my other full-time job to make this content is that even the therapeutic industry is confused. It's like th this understanding, it's like, it's not enough to know that your dad abandoned you and therefore you like unavailable men and feel worthless. To heal from that, that's a good start. But then to heal from that, you have to be able to tune in at, in a visceral way to the pain there to let it out in order to heal.
And so I'm less interested, and in some way it matters less what the content and the story is. It's useful to start to find those parts, but it's like to heal them, it's much more energetic and physical and like grounded. That's which is why we're talking about poop. It's like you poop it out, you wash your hands, you go about your day. It's a very physical thing, right? And don't forget, it's very good mulch too. So you yeah, don't exactly. Grow and rebirth, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's great fodder, so to speak. Yes. To create compost. The day, right? yeah. <laughs> Okay. And yes, I do want to go back to the fact that you said in the first segment that at age 14, you experienced a tragedy that created all of this opening. Yeah. Like, imagine this journey. So we yeah. talk some about that. Yeah. And I'll just say that, you know, I think I had my good share of wounding like we all do from way earlier, um, which may have lined me up to choose someone who was in this much pain. But my first big attachment. Like I was kind of, my parents described me as being a really aloof and afraid and kind of like, I was just doing my own thing, building like doll houses and stuff, yeah. um, which I know you wouldn't think, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, um, but yeah, that was how I was in the family. And so the first person that I had a obsessive desire to be close to, it was my first love, my first attachment, other than the parents, um, was my first boyfriend. And we were together for about a year and a half. And then just before, within the month of both of us turning 15, uh, he told me a very convoluted story um, about something and ended up killing himself. I was the only one who knew and we had an agreement that he wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I was the subject of his suicide note. So that fucked me up pretty good. Um, in a very, I mean, it was a death. You know, it was his actual death and it was... Um, when you say convoluted and you were the subject in his note, do you mean the blame? In no, the not at all. Um, and by the way, episode four is I wrote this beautiful <laughs> memoir narrative of the story. And so sometimes I feel sad if I give too many details in podcast interviews so people can be in the suspense of it. When one of my big bucket list items, we've talked about this is in, in a year or so, I'm going to complete the memoir. But no, he um, the convoluted story was he basically, I thought he was... Uh, I thought he was busted for smoking marijuana and was going, he told me this whole story about how he's going to go to a drug rehab for a few months. And that's how he started introducing that he, he wanted to kill himself. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I, and I dealt with that as best I could as a 14 year old trying to threaten him that I would tell his mom mm -hmm. and, and trying to convince him out of it. And, you know, he had, he had threatened me back that if I intervened, he would do it right then. And then, you know, basically my best 14 year old strategy was to say that I was going to commit suicide. So, um, we, our nicknames for each other were sunshine and, uh, his suicide note was just, which made no sense to his family because, and the, which they were the ones who found it first, but I knew the moment I heard it, it just said, make sure my son still shines. It's basically like, make sure I don't kill myself too. And that's all he left. Um, so, but did I blame myself? You bet your whole self. I'm not going to talk about your ass on your, on your podcast. But yeah, um, I mean, it, it was, and, and I did, you know, um, I'm grateful. I didn't, I didn't want to die when I threatened him with that. That was just my strategy. Um, and I actually had a pretty far out moment in the moments after it was confirmed 100% that he was dead where I've heard a voice clearer than I've ever heard a voice. I don't hear voices, um, not his voice, but a very clear voice said, you'll never do this. And then was gone. I was like in the room with his bawling mother and brother and um, sister, my mom who's screaming. It was really like dramatic um, and excruciating. But, but I did live for a few years um, kind of plotting my death. And, you know, by 15, I mean... The first, real, the, the first moment where I started consciously turning toward healing, I mean, in the beginning, I started kind of looking into what happens to souls that commit suicide, which was grim. And actually, I think part of what's useful and part of what I can do in my life is some education around that uh, at a metaphysical level. Because uh, it's not a good move, not just for everybody else that you leave behind, but actually the souls who do it have a really, really hard time. We can come back to that later. Um, but, you know, so I started studying, but, you know, by 16, I, the first time I, try, I accidentally caught feelings for someone else, I realized I was just a terrible wreck inside. And so I started, found that first therapist who was the only individual therapist that's been actually really useful for me, bless her soul. I don't actually like therapists that much. I think there's a ton of mediocre therapy in the world. I've worked with all kinds of healers, but yeah, that journey, um, you know, I had started healing and having spiritual awakenings by like 17, 18, like in a pretty profound way and studied, 
you know, Eastern religions, lived in Asia, speak Nepali, taught, taught yoga, did all these things, but really was still living with that wound. And it wasn't until actually I got married to someone who was like the archetype of the dead boyfriend, even though I couldn't see that, um, and had this terribly unviable marriage with someone I love deeply and I still love, we're friends, um, that I started working with who I feel is a true master. He asked me to not use his name because he's very private. He's like a man who lives in a mud hut. <laughs> he's built a structure, but like when I first went out there in the desert, he lived in the hut. It's a um, <laughs> what? A shitty hut. <laughs> He's made, he, I've actually stayed in Nepal. I lived in places where they like to clean the floors. They wipe cow poop on the floor. You got to love that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it wasn't until I really did the kind of work that is the heart of the shit show that I started truly healing. And interestingly enough, um, the day that I organically without any effort or, you know, orchestration left my marriage happened to be the 22 year anniversary to the day of the first boyfriend's death. And then I found my dream apartment where we're sitting right now. It's so pretty. It's also in design magazines. If you're curious, it's in apartmenttherapy.com. You can look up Bohemian Rainbow Oakland. You'll see my apartment. But anyway, found this place. I fell in love with it. Was going to move on a Monday, but it was raining. So got pushed back one day and I ended up moving out of my marital home on the dead boyfriend's birthday. Wow. Boom. Mic drop crazy town so, so the shit show is really like what feels like the manifestation the fruiting of the gifts of the karma of my life like i i it's taken me a long time i'm just maybe hopeful that i'm able to attract someone and be like someone who really likes me of um course. But it's taken a long time, but it's made me, I'm like masterful at this. And I say that kind of humbly because I've worked with a real master. I'm not that masterful, <laughs> but as my mentor, but it's like, I'm so fucking good at this. And, I'll date and you, Rachel. I'll date you. Let's just get this <laughs> over with, okay? You're beautiful. You're smart. You got it going on. You're a ton of fun. I'll date you. Let's get over it. I'm Thanks. super fun. Okay. <laughs> well, I definitely can't wait to see you. But um, my point is like the shit show is like really the, the thing that is that has been cultivated and has so much off like value for the world. I think part of what a cool thing my experience is growing up becoming adults is like we have these human experiences. We go through our emotional shit. We have to overcome something, learn something, and it becomes a gift. And as we heal, like the more well-being I have, like my mentor was like, you're going to be indebted by the, the healing you've received. Wow. And the only way to repay that debt is to move it forward, to claim your life and to give this gift. And like, I, who knew? I didn't think I'd make a podcast. I didn't even listen to podcasts. You know, and I'm, and I'm working on a book and I'm going to do the message in all the ways I can do the message. But it's like, this sanctifies that journey and I can help a lot of people and it's such a beautiful, fun thing for me to do. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that. I yeah. think you're bringing it full circle. It is amazing yeah. and I like the fact that it's incumbent on us uh, to take the shit. Basically, it's funny that the shit makes us incumbent to put something magnificent out into the world, but it is yeah. really a soul journey. I, I intimately understand. Yeah. And we're just a quick break here, exclusively for Dare to Dream listeners, watchers. This is just by use. If you have a business, if you're an entrepreneur, if you have products, programs, dude, <laughs> You got to check out Thinkific for real. I am up there right now. I am super thrilled with it. And I've made a unique deal with Thinkific just for you, available only to my listeners. You can create, you can market, you can sell your online courses, start making money, people. It is a powerful all in one platform that makes it so easy to share your knowledge, grow your audience, scale your business. And that's whether you have 10 students or 10 million. So Thinkific easiest technology drag and drop and it looks phenomenal if you use this link you get three months free business wow. plan ta-da it's thnk dot cc slash deb thnk dot cc slash deb and this is your exclusive free deal enjoy enjoy and go make some money this is Rachel Kaplan, we just have a few minutes left. Debbie Dashinger, and this is Dare to Dream. Again, you can find her at the Healing Feeling Shit Show.com. And this is Dare to Dream, Rachel. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future mm. dreams and goals? Mm. Thank you for asking. 
Um, so the first is to publish, and I'm actively working with an editor on it currently, to publish the book version of Emotional Potty Training for Grown Ups um, for the people who won't find podcasts um, to streamline it, take out some of my crass jokes. We might have a section for poop stories, but we're just streamlining into the you know transformational content. So I would love to, in the next year, publish that. Um, and not publish it myself. I think it's my editor's like, oh, no, 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 you're going to publish this. Um, within the next couple years, I want to publish the full memoir, which will be called The Shining of His Son. Like, how the fuck did I go on? A lot of ways, a lot of rock and roll, a little bit of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, can't be president. Good thing I don't want to. Um, yeah, and and then, you know, my other two main goals, I, I'd lo I'd love to have find real love that's based in worthless or worth, like not worthlessness, not dependence, because I've kind of burned through that. I love being alone, but, and um, really hot sex. <laughs> and I think that's it for my bucket list. I met Tom York last year, which was like up there. But other than that, I'm like, take me whenever. <laughs> Actually, you know, the truth is, is I would love, um, you know, I'm interested in, in, speaking and just basically championing this this information this content you know the person who taught me in his very profound gifted way is much more of a introvert you know lives in a mud hat, hut doesn't use the internet and there's a way i'm just much more in the world and so bringing everything i have to bring to this um, transformational information i just feel really i just want to be used by the universe to help us because you know obviously our planet's struggling our cultures are struggling and this is the piece i can do and so i'm really excited about whatever creative options um, that looks like so if it's speaking and workshops or um you know i have a friend who's trying to convince me that, that i should be the um forgetting her name but Marie Kondo of feelings. We should do, you know, just I'm just kind of open to the fun. Well, of I mean, I forward. All the emotions and the poop. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like basically show the emotional transformation. Um, but I just feel, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll stack your shirts of poop. <laughs> so, what's the one thing you do, Rachel, every day that is your ritual, that is your practice, that keeps you really grounded and connected and healthy? The, probably the deepest commitment I have, and it's almost every day, occasionally, if my body needs to or just I need to, I, I will break. But I do exercise every day. It keeps me sane. Um, I'm a, I have a lot of energy. I'm a really physical person, and um, just moving my body you know, helps move the shit. Um, I also like caffeine <laughs> and music. I, I would say I, music uh, and connecting internally into my – kind of my spirit and movement and dancing is my favorite, but I don't necessarily do it every day. I don't know why. But it's yeah. I resonate a lot with what you're saying. I also tremendous energy, love, love, love to move, exercise every day. And when I had this surgery on my back, which by the way is right on my bra line and hard to sleep on, um, I just had it yesterday. So for two weeks, um, I've got these stitches and stuff. I'm and amazed you're doing this today. Yeah, whatever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We show up no matter what the show goes on. <laughs> I gotta say that the, the, one of the things they said is, by the way, you can't sweat. You, mm. can't, you can't lift weights. You can't <laughs> yoga, no body pump. I'm like, oh, for two weeks, what? Like you think they just said for the rest of your life. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's like. Yeah, I get it. Right, so I said to my dog, long walks, girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go some territory out there we're going to be covering. Well, I wonder if that space that you would normally put into physical movement, you could bring into connecting with whatever feelings come up in the void of physical movement, because they would definitely come up for me and maybe do the, move it inside. Okay. Well, we're at the end, but will you give me like a 20 second how to, like, what do you recommend? And I'm on it. Well, whether not being able to move brings up anxiety around, you know, will you be as hot as you are all the time or will you feel stagnant? Are you going to poop as well? It's like tune into the fear, tune into the sadness um, or just in this time, you know, make some special time to be with yourself. Like you were talking, joking about the vanity. It's like, you know, tune into the part that might not, despite how amazing you are, feel as worthy as you are. Mm -hmm. And um you know, try to pull out a photo, sit with it, see if you can't explore why she feels like that and give her some love like you'd give your puppy. I love that. And I love see if that. you can't and cry. For that reminder too, I really also really loved that idea of putting the photo. I have adorable little Debbie pictures, oh but one at a time when it's kind of like, meh. 
like maybe not my most stellar inner side. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. And give her some love. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the this show. so fun. I adore you. And I'm so glad we're now dating. Yes. <laughs> It's real. And it, like, what a way to announce it right here on the podcast, Out Into the World, 75 million people. But you heard it here. Rachel Kaplan, Debbie Dashinger, a thing, right? <laughs> dreams and dreams and poop all rolled into one. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if that gets like announced on Twitter or anything, please tell me if, if you know, because I, th- I think your pull right now is much wider than mine. But um, let me know if there's some good gossip about us. I can't wait. Okay. And I will see you on the dance floor at New Media, right? Are you That's going? Right. I'm going. I'm going. That's where we met. That's where we fell in love. And I'm ending this show with this quote from Yanla Van Zant. Until you heal the wounds of your past, you're going to bleed. You can bandage the bleeding with food, with alcohol, with drugs, with work, with cigarettes, with sex. But eventually, it will all ooze through and stain your life. You must find the strength to open the wounds, stick your hands inside, pull out the core of the pain that is holding you in your past, the memories, and make peace with them. Oh, man. Oh, man. Next week on Dare to Dream podcast, I'm featuring the hilarious serial entrepreneur Jim Beach, who's the award-winning radio host of School for Startups. I've been on his show. And also the best-selling author of the School for Startups book, Tune in for next week's number one transformation conversation. Again, you can get all of these if you want to watch them at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Find me on social media at everything Debbie Dashinger. And remember, the secret of success is having the courage to begin in the first place. Mm.